a sensitive topic. So I will try to uh, explain it and discuss it as easy as possible, so to speak. Um, this is a topic that I think we've uh, discussed in the past in regards to the priests in the temple, where if someone has a blemish, they're not allowed to work in the temple. But we're going to discuss today disabilities and um, all types of disabilities whether it's a emotional disability whether it's physical disability whether it's um, a disease that doesn't allow them to do the mitzvah for whatever reason it may be so we're going to uh, elaborate on this topic today and I'll soon show you why this topic comes up today, even uh, it might not be that time of the year. So we're going to discuss how does Judaism look at people with disability? It's a very sensitive topic. Now, imagine you receive a gift from a friend. Your wedding day. But you cannot use the gift for whatever reason it is. It's just not something that you could use at all, even if you try. Some people might throw it out. They say it's a waste of space. I don't want to keep this in my house. Some people might put it on the shelf out of respect for the person that gave it to you. A third person might say to themselves, you know what, I wish I could use it. Maybe I could figure out a way I'll be able to use it. Well, Torah is a gift that Hashem gave us. But there's certain people that are disabled that cannot use some of the gift that Hashem gave us. What are they supposed to do? Should they just put it on the shelf? Should they just ignore it? What should be their process in order to use the gift that Hashem gave them? The, qu the question really is, are they part of this gift of the Torah that God gave us? Or maybe they're not part of it because they can't use some of it. Today we're going to begin with the giving of the Torah that actually is discussed in this week's portion. Now, we all know that the Torah is split. We read the Torah throughout the year and not necessarily are we, are we going to read the Torah at the current time when it happens. So we read today in the Torah about the giving of the Torah, which obviously happens many months from now, a few, a few months after um, Passover. But we're going to discuss today, we're going to discuss today the giving of the Torah that happened 3,300, 3,333 years ago. As you see here in text number 1a, the Jewish people left Egypt. 40 days later, 49 days later, they received the Torah. And they're about to celebrate the receiving of the Torah. It wasn't just an ordinary event. It was an event that changed the world forever. Physical and spiritual started getting along with each other. The physical part and the spiritual part of the world, as we're going to discuss in a moment, started getting along. In order to do this, Hashem made a production. He made miracles. He made audio and visual. You know, there was thundering and light. Kinds of things going on at this great event. 
What did the Jewish people do while this event took place, the event of the receiving of the Torah? So you see here in text number 1b, very unusual. There was unity between all three million Jewish people. Imagine in Israel, one day a year, everyone gets along. All the Jews, whether you're secular, whether you're Orthodox, whether you're Hasidish, whether you're from Bnei Brak, whether you're from Jerusalem, everybody thinks the same. Everybody is in peace. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Well, this is what happened on the day the Jewish people received the Torah. You know, when there's large crowds, whether Jewish or not, a lot of times people fight with each other. Go to any stadium, there's going to be fights. It's my seat, it's your seat, you're too close to me. Then sometimes, unfortunately, it becomes fist fights, people yelling at each other. You know, everybody turns around, they see two people yelling at each other. Humans are bound to fight. If you live in a, in a condo building, you try to join the board meeting, there's always fights, unfortunately. Disagreements with the board, with the president, with the tenants, with the residents. It's normal. We disagree. The question is how we disagree. But all the Jewish people at the receiving of the Torah, all three million people got along completely with one heart, one soul ready to receive the Torah. They stood together shoulder to shoulder without disagreement. Which tells us that the Torah actually belongs to everybody. When they stood with such unity, it shows us no one was left out. Everybody took part in this great event. Which brings us to our previous question. There are some people that are left out. For instance, if someone is, God forbid, deaf, they cannot hear the shofar. A mitzvah in the Torah to listen to the shofar. They cannot hear the Torah reading every Shabbos. What's with him? He's left out. What if someone, God forbid, doesn't have his left arm? Or if he's a lefty and he doesn't have his right arm, he cannot put tefillin on his hand. He could only put the tefillin on his head. If God forbid he's missing his left arm, he does not put the tefillin on his right arm. He only puts it on his head. So he's missing out on a mitzvah that was given to him. But wait a minute, it says that everybody received the Torah. How is it possible that some people did not receive it? Well, we have an answer for that right here in text number two. Whoever was deaf was healed because it says they heard. Whoever couldn't speak, all of a sudden was able to speak because the Torah says everyone spoke. Whoever was not able to stand on their legs, all of a sudden was able to stand because it says everybody stood at the bottom of the mountain as you see here in text number, in text number two, a few lines from the bottom. Whoever was a fool, meaning whether they were mentally retarded or they were Down syndrome or other issues that didn't allow them to take fully part, they were completely healed. Including Moses that had a stutter was also healed at the receiving of the Torah, as it says in the commentaries. So this would give us a little of an explanation that everybody took part in the receiving of the Torah even the people that had a disability because they were all healed at the receiving of the Torah. So it was a complete one nation. Everyone received it. 
But wait a minute. <laughs> Which you're all thinking right now. It brings us to a big question. They went to the greatest doctor in the world, which is God himself. But what's about today? How do people that have this ability today receive the Torah? Completely every single part of it, including the deaf and God forbid someone that doesn't have arms and so on and so forth. Do they feel that they didn't receive part of the Torah? Is the only way for them to receive it is if they're completely healed? That wouldn't make sense. But look what the Talmud says. Interesting statement in the Talmud, which is brought many times for many different reasons. If it's not your fault, let's, let's pick a simple example. You know, you can't keep Shabbos because it's a matter of life or death. So you're not keeping Shabbat. You had to go in the car to the hospital. You had to make a phone call. You had to do things to save someone's life. So I'm not liable for desecrating Shabbos. I don't have to keep Shabbos. Another example. If you don't have an esrog, Years ago, it's not like today where we have thousands and millions of esrogim available around the world. Years ago, in certain places, it would be impossible to get a hold of an etrog. So if you don't have one, the Torah doesn't make you liable, as you see here in text number 3a. If you're not in Israel and it comes time to bring the Passover sacrifice, you're exempt because you're not there. So too, if the condition of your body does not allow you to keep a mitzvah, then you're also exempt. If God forbid someone is deaf or he's missing his left arm, He's exempt from keeping the mitzvah. That's it. But we all know that Hashem <laughs> is a merciful God. When the Torah says that you can't keep the mitzvah, God does not look at you negative. He doesn't look at you, God forbid, with a negative eye. He tells you, don't worry, you're exempt. This might help us understand a little of the people that are disabled. Think of an, uh, an employee. Everyone, if you're working for a large company, one person is the accountant, the next one is, takes care of sales, the next one takes care of marketing, everybody has their responsibility. If you're in sales and something that has to do with accounting comes your way, you have no responsibility to deal with. It's not your department. It's not your field. The same thing is in the Torah. If God forbid someone is deaf and they cannot hear the shofar, no problem. It, it's, he has no responsibility to hear the shofar. In other words, the mitzvah of hearing the shofar doesn't apply on him. He's exempt from doing it. But wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's go a little deeper. So you're telling me that if someone is deaf, he's missing out on some of the sections of the Torah that God gave us? What, how is that possible? 
I mean, wait a minute. I mean, wait a minute. Would you say that he's missing part of the gift that Hashem gave every one of us? Well, according to the Kabbalah, so we're going to explain now that even someone that's deaf or someone that's missing an arm or someone that doesn't have the ability to walk, or someone that doesn't have the ability to talk. There's something very deep that even he or she are still doing the mitzvah. And let's explain. You know, according to the Kabbalah, when you do a mitzvah, it's like a channel between you and God. There's basically this channel that's connecting between you and Hashem. You turn on the, the television, you turn it to a ter certain channel. I'm saying you turn it today, obviously, there's no turning. It's all uh, remote buttons that we push. But when you change the channel, you obviously connect with another station whether it's sports, whether it's uh, the weather, whether you're listening to, to the news or you're watching a movie. When you go to channel 21, you will see, you will connect with whatever that channel is showing you. Each mitzvah, you receive energy from God when you do a mitzvah. Think of it that you're receiving power. When you eat a piece of cake, you receive energy. When you eat a fruit, you receive energy. When you drink water, you're not dehydrated. When you do a mitzvah, you're receiving energy from God. So again, our question's even stronger. If you're, God forbid, disabled, then... It changes the entire demographics. You're missing some channels. How is your connection? More so, as it says in four, that Hashem spoke to every individual. Look what he said at the Torah. He didn't say, I am Hashem Elokeichem, plural. I am your God, yours. He said, you're as an individual. I am your God. Elokecha. I am the Lord, your God. So how could it be that it's not possible for some people? We were all there at the receiving of the Torah. Every one of us was there. Our souls were all there. And God spoke to everybody, including that person that's deaf today. So how do we have how do we have an understanding that even the disabled are fully connected with every part of So let's discuss a halacha in connection with disability the Talmud has a debate. If someone is blind, okay, deaf, fine, they can't hear the chauffeur blowing. There's, there's no way around it. What if someone is blind? Are they exempt from keeping Torah and mitzvot or not? Now, even though it's hard for him, because he's blind, but he could still do it. He could eat matzah. He could hear the shofar. He could light the Hanukkah candles with help. So do we say because it's hard, he's exempt? Or he's still liable to do it? So Rabbi Yehuda is one opinion here in text number five. 
he says, exempt. A blind man is completely exempt from keeping the Torah and the mitzvot. But the question is, what if you want to keep it? Fine, you're exempt. But what if he wants to keep the mitzvot? Is he allowed to? Or better more, is it worthy for him to even keep it? Or he's just wasting his time? So Rabbi Yosef was a blind man in the Talmud, Rabbi Yosef. He was very happy that he was able to do the mitzvot. Not only because Hashem said to do it, but because he decided to do it because he was blind. Rabbi Yosef was a sage in the Talmud that was actually blind. And he said, even though I'm exempt, I make the decision to do it. I decided that I'm going to keep it so I get the reward for doing it. But wait a minute, is there a purpose? Is there any purpose to do it at all? Well, Rabbi Yosef originally thought that he's exempt from it. But after he found out that he's allowed to do it, meaning he's still liable to do it, he felt even better. Because the mitzvah is greater when you're told to do it than when you do it on your own. In other words, even though there's an opinion that you're exempt if you're blind, if you do it, you receive reward. Let's turn a moment to something Rabbi Yosef said. Rabbi Yosef said, that the day of Shavuot is the holiday we received the Torah. He said, I want you to make for me a great party. Because of this holy day of the receiving of the Torah, I'm special. I'm more special than everybody in the street. This is what he said. Thanks to the receiving of the Torah, now I'm special. Wait a minute. This is very superficial. And besides, this is arrogance. Which Torah scholar would turn around and speak about his greatness? But now we understand a little deeper of Rabbi Yosef. He was blind. And he appreciated his merit that even though he's disabled, he's still able to keep the Torah. He still has an obligation and a privilege to keep it. Without the Torah, he says, I wouldn't be anything. I would be nothing. Let's explain this. Rabbi Man, can I ask a question? Sure. So I'm just listening to what you're saying and about Moses and then his. Sorry, Steve, we don't hear you anymore. How about now? Yeah. Okay. So you were so, listening about Moses, yes. So God had no problem hearing Moses or Moses had no problem communicating with God when he had his list. Um, and the relationship that Moses had with Aaron God probably wanted it that way because it made for a stronger uh, relationship in, in dealing with Egypt. So it just seems a little bit ironic that after having that wonderful relationship between Aaron and Moses, and I think with Moses relying on Aaron, it was a sort of a reminder to him that he needs to do better and, and reach out. So it just seems almost... Um, I don't know what word to use, but interesting that after all the two of them went through to liberate, um, you know, the, the Israelites from Egypt, that then his speech is restored afterwards. 
but yet Hashem wanted it that way, or he would right. have... Right, very interesting, yes. So, yes. It, it almost sounds like, almost, I hear what you're saying about the Torah, but it's almost like they needed that dynamic to do what they did, and it seems almost insulting to, like, he was so wonderful in what he did, why, why not free him from his lips sooner? He needed it right. that way. <laughs> I'm just intrigued by what you said um, in, in how that, how do you, how do you explain that? Because again, he had no problem communicating with God, you know, you never hear. So anyway, I just thought. Well, he still communicated with the people just in a harder way. Right, but that's what Hashem must have wanted or he would have. Been yeah, able to yeah it's, it's a good point. I mean, uh, he should have done it earlier. Um, you, maybe that's what gave Aaron, his older brother, some respect, exactly like you said. I think it was Moses needed to reach beyond himself and yeah. show in cooperation. But again, imagine if it didn't happen that way, it would have been a complete. So again, it, it just that end part that you said that his speech was cured. It's like, why do that? He was perfect in, in his imperfection, the way things were. Right. Okay. Good question. <laughs> Okay, we all know the Rebbe would send uh, people to go to nursing homes and visit people in the nursing home. And he would tell the Hasidim to go bless with them the lulav. And they questioned, they asked the Rebbe a question, as you see here in text number nine. Should they bless with them the lulav or because they're disabled and a lot of them don't necessarily have a clear mind, should we even bother doing with them? And the Rebbe clearly said that you should because these people need more encouragement. The Rebbe was like in favor of Rabbi Yosef's opinion that even though they're exempt, don't, don't disconnect them. The psychological and physical benefit that the people in the nursing benefit when you give them to do a mitzvah. It's not only the physical benefit, but it's also the, definitely the spiritual benefit. So according to this, we could answer what we were asking before. Even though you don't have access to a certain channel, it doesn't mean you're denied from that channel. You could still receive godliness. This is understood from people that are senile that the bottom line is they're exempt from doing the mitzvah, but they could still do the mitzvah. Just because they're exempt from hearing shofar, they could still hear the shofar. But what's with people that physically can't do it? Like I gave the example of being deaf or God forbid missing an arm. How do they receive the energy? So this is our question that we're ending with right now, and let's explain this. How do disabled people receive the energy? Now, this is going to be a fascinating idea that the Rebbe explained. That disabled people could still receive the energy. How? You know, what's the credit for doing a mitzvah? You know, you keep Shabbos. Okay, Hashem sees you keeping Shabbos. If you give charity, Hashem sees you giving charity. If you pray, Hashem sees you praying. There's another way you could get a reward for doing a mitzvah. The way you get a reward for doing a mitzvah is not if you do it. If you encourage others to do it. When you encourage someone else to keep Shabbat, you get the mitzvah. When you encourage someone else to give charity, you get the mitzvah. When you encourage someone else to come to shul and pray, you get part of the mitzvah. But wait a minute. How do you get a reward? You didn't do anything. You didn't give charity. You, gave, you made someone else give $100 to charity. You didn't do anything. How do you receive the reward if you didn't actually do it. Well, look what the Alter Rebbe says in text number 11, something fascinating. Many people think that Torah is do's and don't do's. 
Dal, do this and don't do this. Hashem gave you a list. This is how people look at it. Okay, I have a list. In the morning, I have this long list. Fill in, check. Did I pray? Check. Was I nice to my wife? Check. Did I make a blessing before I ate? Check. Did I, was I rude to someone today? Okay, maybe. All right, X. So they look at life as if it's a list and I need to fill out the checks. But that's very shallow. So there's something much deeper. A mitzvah is not only to be on God's good side. When you do a mitzvah, you change the world. Let's look at tefillin. It looks very physical. It's a parchment. It comes from an animal. Look how physical it is. Every part of your tefillin came from an animal. The parchment, the box, the straps, it all came from an animal. What do you do when you put the mitzvah? It's not about receiving more cookies in your cookie jar in heaven. It's much deeper. When you take the fur of the animal and you put it on your hand and your head and you say the Shema, you are actually bringing holiness to the animal. To the animal. You take something very mundane and you bring it holy. Now the animal becomes holy. You can't put it on the floor, the tefillin. You cannot bring it in the restroom. You just made a bridge between physical and spiritual. This is something Hashem was waiting for you from the creation of the world. Do you need reward? Why would I want reward? Look at what I just did. I brought down godliness into the world. <laughs> That's the best reward I could get. Think about a heart specialist. The biggest reward that he or she gets is that she healed her patient. Doesn't even need to get paid. That's secondary. Her biggest reward is, is that someone else was healed. From this perspective, the disabled Jew, that helps, and here comes our answer, how disabled people still receive an enormous amount of energy and reward for the mitzvah. That's disabled. And they're not able to do the mitzvah they still receive credit. Because when they influence someone else to do it, the energy is coming into the world through their influence. It makes no difference who does the mitzvah. The main thing is, is that the mitzvah is done. You encourage someone else to do it. Therefore, a Jew that's disabled and cannot do the mitzvah can gain pleasure from the spiritual part which they're bringing into the world, which they would have brought when they did a mitzvah. The transformation that you do in every mitzvah was when we received the Torah. It wasn't all the time. Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob maybe did filling through sticks and through other things that they did when they, when they, some many other people, they, when they put on Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, when they moved sticks around, they did the idea of filling. But when we received the Torah, it came into the spirit, the spirituality came into the world. Before the Torah was given, there were strict guidelines. Spirituality stayed spiritual and physical states faith stay physical. Take an animal and make it holy. It wouldn't work. When we received the Torah, it changed. We infuse the physical world. Physicality becomes more spiritual. And this is exactly what Rabbi Yosef was saying. If not for this day of the receiving of the Torah, I would be nothing because I'm blind. And I wouldn't be able to keep the Torah. But now that I found out that blind people could also bring the energy. Now I'm worth something.
every person, even if you cannot put on tefillin, let's say, or if you can't hear the shofar, if you can't walk around like other people, you could still transform the world to godliness. Rabbi Yosef did not only teach us how to do it, but he lived it. Rabbi Yosef was a great scholar. It says that he was like Mount Sinai. What that means is when he made a statement, it was so strong that it's as if we received it from God at Mount Sinai, he used to prove it all the way up to the receiving of the Torah. That's how strong his statements were. So let's conclude with this idea. You know, there was someone that wrote that um, lost his arm in the, in the army in Israel. Before he lost his arm, when he was going to fight the battle, he asked Hashem and he said, if I survive the battle, I take upon myself to put on tefillin every single day. Guess what? He survived, but his left arm was blown off. So, he was very upset. God saved his life, but he couldn't put on tefillin. And he went to many rabbis and they gave him all kinds of answers that he really was unhappy with. And he finally met the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And he told the Rebbe his dilemma. And the Rebbe told him, you are bringing down the energy that you would bring down through putting on the tefillin by doing other mitzvot. That same energy is coming down into the world. You don't have to bring it down through the tefillin. You're bringing it out through other things. This is the idea of the mitzvah. Rabbi Yosef and anyone that's disabled has the ability to access all the channels through encouraging others to do those mitzvot. You're getting part of the mitzvah that someone else is doing. There was a story with a family, with a parent, with parents of a child that was autistic. And they came to the Rebbe and they asked for a blessing. So the Rebbe said, although they experienced challenges, They still have a close relationship with God. In other words, although they're lacking relationships with others, they have a strong relationship with God himself. They might not be busy with people. They're busy with God. The Rebbe asked, do you have a charity box in her room where she is? They said no. The Rebbe said, if you put a tzedakah box in her room, she will give tzedakah, and then others that come in will also put money in the pushka. The Rebbe looked with people with this disability. He didn't see it as, a, as their, um, their connection with Hashem. He said they have a special connection with God. Not that they're exempt from the mitzvah, but they have the ability to help others through their mitzvah. When they help others, then it's as if they're doing it. So there's two ways to look at this concept. Either they're getting the energy that they would receive from the mitzvah by doing other mitzvot, or by encouraging others to, let's say, hear the shofar, they get that energy and that power that would come down upon them through hearing the shofar by encouraging others. So disability is not lacking that same energy that all of us 
are bringing down into the world. And this is what we take from the story with Rabbi Yosef. He was blind, but he kept all the mitzvot. He felt the energy, and therefore he wanted to keep the mitzvot in any case. And he happened to be a great Torah scholar, although he was blind. Any questions? All right. Hi, Jeffrey. Hi there, Rabbi. Wow, that's fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're wearing a nice suit today. No, 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 no. Really, this is just like almost uh, my jammies. Okay, you know. Ah, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> this shirt. Yeah, it's very I'm comfy. Cool it looks like a, it looks like a suit jacket. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's the good thing with Zoom. You know, uh, you don't get. You the can't school. tell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was actually when when. Uh, when the COVID started and everybody was giving classes on Zoom, there was a Chabad rabbi that was sending out a, a funny clip of a rabbi that was giving a class and he was trying to take care of his kids and do everything and he forgot that he was still wearing his pajamas. So he put on his suit and his tie, but then he stood up to go do something to his kid while he was giving the class. And from his waist down, he was basically, you know, still, uh, so, you know, that's the, the only thing you got to be careful when you're on the Zoom to make sure you're. Oh yeah, oh yeah. There's stories about lawyers um, have, uh, trying to make arguments on Zoom 